Hello, and welcome to the first ever episode of the Posecast with Rabbi Shmuel Posner. My name is Seth Hellman. I'm the co-host of this podcast, joined, of course, by the podcast namesake, Rabbi Shmuel Posner. Rabbi, how are you doing today? Good afternoon, and thank you so much for motivating me to do this podcast. I hope it'll, it'll be beneficial to the listeners to learn something. We'll be able to communicate with people. Thank you so much. So the, the genesis of this podcast was a, a Yuntif table conversation. And, and we had the discussion, and I kind of brought it up half-jokingly, and then I, post-Yuntif, received a text from the rabbi saying that he wanted to go ahead and actually go and do this. So that's, that's kind of where we are today. I'm, I'm sure that a lot of the people who are going to be listening to this are going to know who you are, but I think we're going to draw an audience that might not necessarily know everything about you. So well, let's start from the beginning. Well, we're not going to start from the very, very beginning, and I'm not going to tell them everything about me. They can do some guessing on their own. But I think what's relevant to where we are right now is where we started out here in Boston um, in 1985. That makes it, what, about 38 years or something like that. And um, here at the Chabad House, I came here with my wife, Hani, and our daughter, Rachel. She was three weeks old at the time. This was in August, late August. And we joined the Chabad House crew. There actually was the main rabbi who started the Chabad House and directs the Chabad House here and, other, and the Chabad House in Newton and other Chabad houses around the state of Massachusetts. And there was another rabbi living here in the Chabad House at the time, Rabbi Albert Perlmutter, who is, now lives in California and runs a Chabad House there. And so we came on board to be the in-house rabbi in Rebetzin. We moved into the Chabad House in 1985, dealing primarily focusing on university students, Boston University and other universities. At the time, there was no other Chabad House on campus in this area. So we were the Chabad House on campus from, from Brandeis to Harvard to Tufts to Berkeley to Simmons to Northeastern and to Wellesley. Obviously, we didn't get students today from everywhere, all those colleges, but we were, were represented. And since then, we've, Baruch Hashem, raised our family here, our children, and now, thank God, we have grandchildren. And so that's what we're here now. That's what, what, that's what I do at the Chabad House. Um, reach out to students, try to educate them about Judaism, get them to participate. And the way we do it is not, is multifaceted. There's education and there's experience. Experience can start with a meeting on campus to put on tefillin, have a discussion, um, a hamatash before Purim, a latka before Hanukkah, and from there we take it to, you want to learn more, come to a class, you want to participate in Shabbat, come to Shabbat, and that's where we're at. So when this idea came up about doing a podcast, my, I was all over it, because I did at some point do some recording and had it posted on our website, but you know, like everything, you, get, you start something and you, you know, get tired of it, whatever. And of course, um, posting on Facebook and Instagram and sending out weekly emails, and... And I realize that so many people are doing these podcast type things. There's so many voices out there, and there's so many people listening to those voices. I figured, yeah, let's let my voice get out there too, and and share you know things that I've learned. And of course, as a shliach at Lubavitcher Rebbe, gleaning most of that wisdom from the Rebbe and his teachings. And this is a great opportunity. And the fact that Seth, you challenged me, that was like okay. Let's do it. I don't know why I was in the particular mood then of saying, yeah, like, hey, let's go do it. I, you know, I, I could afford an hour or two every week to, to do this thing. Let's get it done. And so, in fact, after you mentioned it to me, I think I had to remind you or nudge you three times until you finally set up this meeting and get this going. So um, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a busy time of the year, Rabbi. You know, for, for a college student, it's, uh, you know, you got to get through all the, the end of your exams. But we found plenty of time to to come over here and do this so obviously you're a chabad guy which means that 
you're from Crown Heights and you learned in Crown Heights. So what would you say was the defining moment for you in your education and your upbringing in Crown Heights that led you to want to be a Chabad Shliach? Um, excellent question. I would say that <clears throat> anybody who becomes a Chabad Shliach will tell you that it's because of the motivation of the Rebbe. And the Rebbe started speaking about this very early on. In fact, the Rebbe sent Shluchim before he was the Rebbe, when he was the son-in-law of the previous Rebbe, in, and he came to America a year after the previous Rebbe, in 1941 he came, and he was then started, he started organizing, sending people, he was, you know, was obviously under the direction of his father, who was the Rebbe at the time, but he was involved in sending Shluchim even then. And shortly when he became the Rebbe, he emphasized that all those people that had become Shluchim during his father's um, life, the father-in-law's lifetime will continue on their mission and will increase. So the Rebbe spoke about this multiple, multiple times. It was, pretty, it was a com- pretty consistent theme. And so anybody who listened to the Rebbe's talks at the gatherings called the Fabrengen would pick up on that, that this was the thing that the Rebbe wa- really wanted people to do. So, and when we were in yeshiva, like starting in like post high school, even high school and post high school, we would take time, like on Friday afternoons, when there's no official learning in the yeshiva after like 12 o'clock, and go out and reach out to people, which, wherever we were, when I was in Brooklyn or in Marstown or Florida or in London, wherever I was in yeshiva at the time, we would go out and meet with people and share with them some Torah. We'd print something up for the parish, we could Torah portion, with our tefillin and our mezuzahs and you know, anything else that we could help them out, get them Jewishly involved. So the idea of reaching out to other people and inspiring them about the beauty and value of Judaism as a study and as a lifestyle started pretty early in my lifetime. Now, throw into the mix that this is actually in the blood of our family, the Posner family. My grandfather, bless his memory, was a shliach in a number of places, but his most prominent shliach was the one he spent the last 50 years of his life which was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he started a school and a whole Chabad community there. And, um, and I always you know, admire my grandfather for that and, and always look forward to being something like that. You know. And in fact, my parents were sent on, on Shlichus in 1950 when they first got married. For, they were different places also. And when they started out, um, my father's older brother, blessed memory, was a well-known shliach in Nashville, Tennessee for 60 years. Um, his youngest brother was a shliach in Israel, and uh, his sister and her husband were in Milan, Italy. I'm just giving you, a, 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 I have older cousins that were shluchim in different places. My brothers were in shluchim in different places. So it was almost natural to want to do that, both from the experience of my family and from the encouragement, implicit encouragement of the Rebbe um, and as Fabrengans. Is there one teaching from the Rebbe or one thing that he did one day that, that you saw and really inspired you? I don't think there was one thing, but I think there was one theme. And that theme was consistently emphasizing the idea of Avas Yisrael, love of fellow Jew. And love of fellow Jew means you care about them. So, you know, if, if a Jew came to you or didn't come to you, and you saw that they were hungry and needed food, you give them food to eat. Or if they needed clothing, you give them clothing to wear. So in a spiritual sense, it's the same thing also. Now, if they didn't know they needed it, it's even more urgent that you go and you know, communicate with them and let them know that what, that what they're missing. So that was pretty much the... the that was pretty much the... I, so there wasn't really one moment. Um, as, a, as a yeshiva bach, we were, a group of us were sent... Uh, after high school, a year after, uh, well, a couple years after high school, we were sent as we were then about eighteen years old. We were sent as a group to Florida, to a, to Miami, to a yeshiva, to be like the older bachram there, to be mentors to younger students. And we had like a short meeting with the Rebbe, a personal meeting, the ten of us, um, right outside his office. He spoke to us and, and gave us a blessing, and and that that was, that was very impactful because you know you saw that the Rebbe was giving us personal attention. And, you know, he was invested in what we're doing. So it wasn't, 
there was there was no disconnect between us and the Rebbe when we go when we go on on our mission. Similarly, when Chani and I came to Boston, we wrote a letter to the Rebbe asking him for his agreement, um, endorsement of our coming to Boston and his blessing. And we described a few different options that we had in mind, and we actually said we, we thought this was the best option for us for different reasons. And he gave us his blessing and his, you know, his instruction we should go and gave us his blessing. So there is that per- very personal connection to the Rebbe. But now that we're on the subject of shluchim, a personal connection to the Rebbe, you have to keep in mind that since 1994, the third day of Thomas, the Rebbe is not physically in the world. And I emphasize this physically, not to sound weird, but we connect to people that aren't physically here. I mean, even think about it, you know, you're a college student. Your parents, God bless them, are alive and well. They're not physically in Boston, and there are certain things that you do because you feel their presence, like, oh, my, if my mother knew this, my father knew that. So it affects you in that way, um, which is a good thing, which is wonderful. If they're good parents, it's great. That means that their influence is there with you. Um, and you don't, you don't have to be overtly saying, oh, I wouldn't do this because my mother wouldn't mind to do it. But in your mind, you're actually behaving the way that they brought you up. So in the Rebbe, in relationship of a chasa to the Rebbe, the same thing also. The fact that the Rebbe is not physically with us, his, you know, we study what he teaches, we know what he taught us, we hear what, you know, we have recordings of things he's talking about, and we think about it and say, well, hmm, the Rebbe would want me to do this, want me to do that. Just like today, I was talking to a um, student at Berkeley, Yonah Baruch, and the man, the myth, the legend. Yes, we will be name dropping on this podcast, by the way. So be careful. Um, and, and and what we normally do is we have we have reserved um, a space at Berkeley College of Music, which is just a few blocks away, and we go and we table there for a couple of hours on Wednesday because it works out with his schedule, and, and and so I have it scheduled in that I spend a couple hours there. And this morning, when we were on the way to Minion in Brookline. I said to me, I'm not really in, you know, we don't, we, there's two places we can be. There's the number one place, number two place. The number one place is more central. Number two is not so central. It's by, it's, it's, there's a lot of students here, but it's not so central. And I, don't, I don't like the second place as much as the first place. Anyway, I said to him, well, we have that other, the second place is reserved because the first place wasn't available. I don't know if I really want to go. Now, he gets out of class at 1 o'clock. Now, I always arrive there before 12 o'clock because that's high time because people are going for lunch. It's near the cafeteria and chat classes are ending and changing. So he said to me, sort of half joking, he said, well, you know, why don't you come for an hour from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock? I mean, the time that he would get there. And I said, fine, I'll do that. And, of course, I got there at 12.30 because once I'm going, I'm going to do it right. And, um, and it, was, it was very, it was very um, successful Met some kids that I knew, a couple of a new kid, a kid that from Australia who was who his parents actually interesting. They they immigrated from Australia to Australia from Ukraine in 1990, and he was very proud of his Jewish name. But he hadn't put on tefillin for a long, long time. He put on tefillin with him. So you know, you think you know what would when I when I was when, when I was talking to Yonah Baruch and afterwards I was thinking, well, what would the Rebbe want me to do? And obviously, he wants me to go there and. But it was nice that he said we're going to do it. So that was that was uh, very helpful. So you know those that influence of the rabbi had, which is the same thing also this podcast is because you said let's do the podcast. Then I then I thought about it for a day or two. I said of course the rebbe would want me to do the podcast because the rebbe was big into using everything in the world to spread the message of Judaism, like he was into technology. He wanted technology to be used and and was very happy to do. I mean the first. I, I think the first person to actually use technology to broadcast a message live across the world was the Rebbe. Now, it wasn't he himself that figured it all out, but he embraced it openly and said, yes, absolutely, and I was very, very happy to do it. The idea of you know, getting the, his, his message instantaneously around the world. And this happened, I think, in the early 70s. When it, it really, the technology didn't really exist. Some chassid came up with like, wiring some telephones together. He figured it out, whatever. You can go to Crown Heights and, and 770, check out WLCC and see how they did it. So the idea of using technology, in fact, our perspective is everything that's created in the world is to serve Hashem. Now this is based on an actual Midrash which says gold was only created to be used in the temple. 
So once it's created for the temple, it's also used for your know, personal use. It's okay. So we look at technology and all these modern innovations that we have. The Rebbe's approach is use it for, they're not, some people say, oh, when television was, was a big thing, right? Back in the last century when television was a big thing. Like, don't have a television in your house. And the Rebbe even spoke about it. Don't have it. He said, if you bring a television to your house, you know if you bring it to your house? What's on television? You have a circus on, the telev- on, te- on television. You can have even a non-Jewish religious building on, 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 a, on television. You bring all of that and violence and everything else. You bring all that into your house. Would you like invite these people into your house? No, you do. You're not. So he, he was very much against having television. But lo and behold, back in, in the early 70s, when Chassid said, wait, we can broadcast your message via, via cable television. They had to bring huge dish, you know, huge dish then on the truck. We can use that to broadcast your message. Everybody said, yeah, for sure, let's do it, let's do it, yeah. And many people got turned on to Judaism by, by chance, quote-unquote, flipping to the channel, seeing the Rebbe talking, and that inspired them. So doing the podcast... So using the, being up to date on all the things. Of course, the internet has its challenges. But we don't, that's, and you have to be careful like anything else in the world. Food has its challenges. You eat the wrong food or you eat too much food, you, you know, you have to be healthy. It doesn't mean all food is good to eat. You have to be, do with moderation and, and use your, your head, knowing what's the right thing to do. So also with technology works the same way also. So therefore, I'm talking for a long time now, but therefore, the... The idea of having this podcast was very um, welcome, and I hope that it'll be well received, and we can, you know, have some more conversations talking about anything you want. You know, for a moment there, I thought I was getting compared to the Rebbe. <laughs> you, started, you started going in about it, and you were like, "All right, well, you know, the the the, the Rebbe had these ideas, and you inspired me, and well, you know, Seth, you inspired me to do this podcast." And well, I yeah, like, I have no, pro- I have no problem with that. I, I know <laughs> the same way that Yona Baruch inspired me to go to Berkeley today. <laughs> you inspired me. Yeah, I think that's I'm. You know, I'm. Yeah, the answer to that is yes, and I've been actually thinking about that lately. That a number of times there have been in you know certain situations when you just need a little pull. It could be just someone saying, "Hey, I'll give you another example." Okay, there's this kid that has a pair to fill in. He goes to Boston University, has his own pair to fill in, and for some reason I can't, I haven't yet figured it out. Um, if he sees me on campus, he'll put on film. But then finally I said to him, "If you have your own pair to fill in, do it at home." Okay, so that he's supposed to, he's supposed to, he's supposed to do it at home. At, in his dormitory. But then he said, you know, Rabbi, if you, you have to message me every day to remind me, which is the most inane thing in the world because your mother doesn't message you every morning to brush your teeth or, or to put on, on your pants. pants. <laughs> right? So why do I have to remind you to, to put on filling? You know, it's, it's something you should know you're going to... But, but on the other hand, and, and in one way I, I want to say to him, like, dude, get your act together. On the other hand, I'm thinking to myself, if all it needs... If he needs me to remind, I'll remind him. Big deal. So I don't have it on, on, on a calendar, but every day I think, so, oh, I may actually remind, remind Jake to put on tefillin. So yesterday, I remember at 5 o'clock, I said, I, I messaged him, hey, did you, put on, did, you, did you put on tefillin today? He said, no, I didn't put, oh man, I didn't put on tefillin. I said, where are you? He told me he's on campus at the GSU. That's the student union. And I'd been in the student union earlier yesterday at like one, two o'clock, and I met a couple of kids, put on film with them. And I was like, oh man, it's five o'clock. I said to him, okay, I'll be there in a few minutes. I didn't want to tell him that I wasn't on campus. I actually drove halfway to campus, then walked for another 10 minutes and went there and brought him to film to put on. When I met him, he was sitting with a few friends, one of them that I know. A few of them had put on film already, and this one other guy didn't put on film. And he, and I, while I was there, I put on film with him. So I walked out of there, not upset at Jake at all, because it was because of him that this other kid put on film. Because I could have said to him, like, "Don't be lazy, go back to your dorm." Or I could have made, could have said a thousand things to him. The simplest and easy thing to make sure he would do it, or to give him the opportunity to do it, was for me to go there. So I didn't want to go, but he motivated me to go there. And as a result of that, the second guy also put on film. So this idea of getting motivation from different places 
or seeing things, seeing opportunity. I would say, let me just change the tone over here a bit. Seeing it as an opportunity, and not just, I don't need to be motivated to put on film with him, but going there, saying like, wait a second, he didn't put on film today. Now he's sitting there in the, in the GSU. Did, maybe this Hashem wants me to go there because there's an opportunity, which ended up being exactly that way. Now, if, I, if only he had put on fill in, I wouldn't have been upset either. Well, that's, that's worthwhile on its own. But then I was, the other guys were sitting with him. We schmoozed a little. We spoke a little Torah. And this other kid put on fill in. So it was, you know, it was great. So um, being motivated by other people and also seeing it as um, a great opportunity, thinking like, oh, wow, yeah, this is a good thing. I should do this. So today is a very special day for a number of different reasons. Obviously, we're recording our first podcast, but it's also the birthday of the country of Israel. And Israel was very important to the Rebbe. He was very, very um, supportive of the state, but he never moved there. And I've always found that really interesting. So I don't know if you have any insight on that, but what would you, you know, on Israel's birthday and the importance of, of Israel to the Jewish people, what do you think the Rebbe would have to say? Okay, so we've changed gears now. Now we're getting like into the deep stuff, which is fine, which is fine. This, this can go any direction, anywhere. Um, the reason the Rebbe didn't move to Israel now, I say the reason. There's probably a few the reasons. But one thing that the Rebbe actually said, that I know this, he said that to be able to have influence, the great, the, the greater, the, to have the greater influence on the, most, the, the greatest amount of Jews would if he, if he be in America. He said people in America are not going to listen to a rabbi living in Israel. So there was other things about that also. But why the Rebbe doesn't live in Israel? Um, he said, and, and that was that was, and, and you can see this clearly. See, some people ask this question. I say, what do you, why, why are you questioning? The Rebbe was the most successful Jew, maybe in history, in spreading out and um, publicizing Judaism for Jews in the, in the existence of the Jews. Now, of course, the tools he had weren't, weren't available a hundred years ago, but he used them in such a way that it was so effective and it's incredible. So you know you can't even you, you can't even question why the Rebbe did this, but that that would be the because you see the, the, the you know what does it say the proof is in the pudding whatever that means, but you see the, what actually happened was the Rebbe was very successful being where he was so you can't say why didn't do something else, but that was the reason that he actually said that he felt that he would be more effective being here in America, people in America would listen to him and people in Israel listen to him as well, so this is the most place that he's most effective. But since you opened this, the, the, the uh, subject about Israel and being what you call it the birthday or the Independence Day, and this is, a, this is somewhat of a controversial issue amongst different segments amongst the Jewish people, especially the more observant Jews. Like, do, we, do we celebrate, not celebrate? How do we daven? We do this, that, the other thing. And what the Rebbe said was that we can celebrate the miracles that happened to, Israel, to the Jews in Israel. You don't have to get, don't get involved in, is 1948 a beginning, is not a beginning, you know, it's, is, is you know, the, the, the establishment of a secular government. Leave all those questions aside and focus on the positive. And the Rebbe was very, very emphatic about the importance of Jews living in Israel. And I'll just put this out there, just to, the Rebbe said, I actually told this to my grandfather, my father was there at the time, way back in the 50s, and the Rebbe said, the whole issue of whether or not there should be a government in Israel is a non-question. It's a mute point. Why? He says, there are Jews living in Israel. Okay? And there's a government that has an army that protects them. If that government and that army wouldn't be there, God forbid, who knows what happened. If, there, if Jews lived in any place in the world and there's a government and an army that protects, the, protects their lives, we have to support that government. Is, why should Israel be any different? We should abandon, God forbid, abandon the Jews in Israel because they live in Israel. Like what do you, what, and because the government is a secular government, who cares regarding whether or not they should be a, a, a viable and strong government with the ability to protect the Jews? No question about it whatsoever. 
So that's 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 point number one. Point number two is the holiest of the land of Israel has always been there, and for Jews to be there is just an amazing thing. So when we talk about anniversary, it's an anniversary of a large. This is a, no one can dispute. This is an anniversary of a great number of Jews settling in Israel and being there for the past seventy-five years with the protection of a of a Jewish army. And many, many miracles have happened to the Jews because of that, and we should celebrate that, and we should thank Hashem for what He's done for the Jewish people in Israel and for all the Jews around the world. So I think, I think that's a good stopping point for, for week one. Stick with us for the future. We're going to have a lot, of, a lot of different things. I'm sure we're going to have a lot more Rabbi Posner campus stories, I'm sure I'll have a few stories. I'm sure we're going to talk a little Gemara. We're both learning the same thing right now. Me and Daf Yomi, Rabbi Posner in the Chabad, learning once a year type of things. Well, not once a year, one year long for one uh, Masechta. We're both in Sota right now. Uh, so I'm sure we'll discuss that. We'll probably discuss a couple of mimers and this and that, but we'll see how this goes. We'll see where it goes. Right, and... and, and um Anybody who's listening who wants it to go in any direction they like, just contact us and uh, you'll hear you'll be hearing from us. All the best.